Hello everyone, welcome to our Future of Hospitality webcast series. Um, I'm Alice and a uh, very great pleasure to introduce our feeder special. So I'm joined today, our, our guest in the chair is Ria Grover, who is the founder and CEO of uh, FIDA. And I'm also joined as a guest presenter and question asker by Sean Fitzgibbon, who leads Restaurant Associates for us. So we're going to go into um, a bit about how technology is very much changing the face of what we do as a catering industry, how that's going to be a really good thing, particularly particularly coming out of coronavirus and how the world is changing and what we're all going to do collectively um, to move into the future in a way that is really positive. So I'm going to start with a couple of questions for Ria about where FIDA has come from and also Ria where you've come from. Um, so you grew up in the UK but then you spent quite a lot of time in the States and now you're back in London. So where did Feeder come from? Where did the idea come from? And, and why start it in London? Why here? So uh, you're right, I grew up in London and I spent some time studying in the States. Um, I actually started my career in investment banking, financial services, and, um, you know, had a great few years, but didn't really want to spend my life doing that. Um, so I went over to the States to do my MBA um, and went to Harvard Business School, which was an amazing experience. And, you know, Boston is a, a technology ecosystem um, completely. So really had the, the privilege to um, get access to some sort of great learning into how to build technology companies and, and see some of the kind of the world's best um, tech coming out of that region. So I decided to move back to London, um, my hometown, and, and really with a kind of entrepreneurial mindset, very keen to start something. And food tech was something that I was really passionate and excited about. I felt that, um, you know, food service and um, food is this thing that's so fundamental to, uh, you know, who we are and how we exist on a daily basis. And actually technology um, hadn't really permeated that sector much. We, um, we still had quite, quite traditional ways of doing things. And I saw real opportunity to help um, kind of, to use tech to um, kind of to improve the offerings and services out there. Um, the, the problem that we um, ended up specifically really wanting to tackle was how people accessed food at workplaces. So knowing that there is a, you know, whole host of companies, a majority of companies out there that don't necessarily have the privilege of having in-house restaurants, you know, how are their staff able to access healthy, high quality food on a daily basis at the right price points? Um, and one of the reasons actually why London is such a first great first market for us to have launched our business in is this is one of the most innovative um, food cities in the world. So actually there's loads of innovation with um, new brands, um, new food businesses operating out of high street restaurants or kind of virtual kitchens um, um, producing great products. And um, we wanted to create a product experience that got that in front of people. Um, and that's really sort of how our business started. So you kind of mentioned there that there is obviously there's competition in your market. And I guess when FIDA started, uh, companies like Deliveroo were already out there. Um, what did you see in the opportunity, particularly to support people with workplace feeding, that those big general companies weren't providing? Kind of how would you differentiate Feeder from that offer that I guess was already there when Feeder came along? Um, you're right that there was um, a bunch of activity in the, the kind of direct to consumer space. So apps like Deliveroo that helped people get kind of get one person order a takeaway from one destination either to their office or home. But um, I, I felt that um, we were quite early in terms of innovation of um, kind of how to feed multiple people um, sitting in the same place every day, sitting in their workplace. Um, and actually like, the needs for, of businesses getting regular food in is quite different to, I think, um, the needs of an individual ordering a takeaway meal. So we set out to build a platform that was really focused on business. Um, so, you know, some of the aspects of that is um, sort of thinking about the kind of restaurant choice, the price points, um, the menu, the ordering experience, um, some of the corporate integrations that are needed for companies to be able to subsidize meals, um, you know, all the kind of invoicing and platform features that comes with that, um, the types of operational model that 
um, kind of works really well in corporate environments. So, you know, you don't want hundreds of different drivers turning up. You want um, to be um, grouping together deliveries um, into fewer deliveries that, that come into the workplace. Um, and then we also really differentiate from delivery because we um, have a very strong focus on health and well-being in our platform and um, that we think is a very important and central part of kind of workplace eating um, which we can we can talk a little bit more about in due course so i think in summary we wanted to approach something that was business first um, and a big part of kind of leveraging large group orders is being able to drive better price points as well for the end customers um, so you know a typical meal and delivery might end up setting you back um, kind of 10 to 15 pounds for a single order. But actually, um, if you're grouping together 70 or 80 meals, um, each individual can be eating for sort of seven or eight pounds, for example. So um, I think it was the combination of a menu and a platform experience that was much better geared to individual daily eating at work, but also all the corporate features and the operations and the customer service that actually made this fit for businesses and something that businesses wanted to implement and for their workforce. Cool. And um, so I guess now we come to the bit where we've entered uh, into um, a partnership with you and we're, we're working alongside you on on lots of different things, actually. Mm. But from your perspective, um, I suppose, why does that make sense? Because you could look at that and go, actually, we're natural competitors. We come from a place where we have a more maybe traditional background in ca corporate catering and you're the new entrant and it's a delivery platform and all these things where are the places where we can work together and and why from your perspective are we partnering rather than competing well interestingly i think we um tradition i think we're a great complementer as opposed to um competitors and actually there's really we we wanted to join the platform because we think there's really strong ways that we can leverage Compass is kind of huge global platform, but also Compass can leverage our technology um, to drive innovation for your client base. Um, we um, traditionally have actually worked with companies that don't have in-house restaurants. So targeting companies that are looking for delivery services, um, you know, for their meals, either for, for breakfast, lunch or dinner, and that can be via individual meal ordering with a corporate allowance or it can be group catering um, but equally we um, I think there's lots of ways we can partner with kind of enterprise sites like like the ones that Compass and RA work with specifically um, so supporting with meals that they don't traditionally serve um, you know they might not have a dinner offering or a breakfast offering on some sites um, supporting with kind of getting experiential pop-ups um, on site is something um, that we've done, um, but also kind of integrating our software as part of the core ordering experience for kind of um, restaurants on site, because I think that digitalization is a trend um, we're going to see more and more of. And I think it really um, enhances somebody's food at work experience. And, you know, if there are if people are able to kind of access the on site restaurants and, you know, loyalty and other benefits through an app product on site and um, I think there's great things that can come from that so kind of to summarize why we want to be why we're so excited to be part of the Compass platform um, I think you know you can help us to um, kind of reach new businesses and and expand our range of offerings and we're obviously backed by a parent company that has tremendous experience in the food space um, and and you know we have technology that I think really enhances um, what Compass are doing. So I, I really see it as a win-win and I think there's a lot of complementarity um, between what our, our sort of core service offerings are. Yeah, that's good news because I would agree with all of that. So <laughs> excellent. Um, can I ask about your, your vendors? You mentioned uh, in that answer the vendor base that you work with and for as long as I've known about Feeder, I've really admired the companies that you work with as food providers. You have a lovely mixture of really authentic local passionate providers how are they doing at this point in time how are they surviving covid and what are their thoughts for the future we do we have an amazing restaurant base that we've curated um we look for kind of you know the best brands um in kind of the best food innovation a healthy high quality sustainably sourced food and um, that's kind of made fresh every day um, and we go out and bring these restaurants onto our platform um, for companies to be able to order from. I think we um, 
you know, luckily there's been a, a tremendous amount of government support um, for some of these businesses and, um, you know, a lot of them aren't operating in this period, but I think we'll manage to open up um, kind of post-COVID and, and then continue to grow their businesses um, kind of when we get out of this period. We probably will expect that some won't reopen, um, but it's probably too early to know right now exactly kind of what that number looks like. What I would say though is um, because we've taken an approach, sort of a relatively curated approach to building our restaurant community, we're generally bringing on really popular high quality brands that have you know, grown tremendously over the last few years. So, you know, they might have grown from one to five or six sites. Um, so therefore they are fairly kind of resilient businesses. And I, I, I do believe that the vast majority of them will bounce back. Um, in the meantime, a lot of them have pivoted to home delivery offerings um, to beyond sort of their, their standard corporate offerings. And I suspect over the coming year, um, as office sort of partial workforces go back into offices, they'll be doing a mix of home delivery and also um, kind of office delivery. Yeah, I, I, I guess leading on from that, then I have to ask you this question because it, it's something that's really close to my heart is as we come out of the whole coronavirus thing and people have learned to work in their home environment and I would bet that some of those instincts are going to continue into the future. Are you starting to think about um, feeder as being uh, a platform that could in some way also play a role supporting people at home? Because I certainly think from the business that I support that there will be a role for us in some way across both the workplace and perhaps home working. Is that also something that's on feeder's agenda? Well, one of the things that we're thinking about first and foremost is the fact that there's going to be very flexible um, numbers back on site over the coming months. You know, we're not going to see full um, office occupancy, you know, maybe even for another year. Um, and actually, one of the kind of inherent parts of our platform is to allow for that flexibility. So the way our cloud canteen works is once somebody, once a company sets up a cloud canteen in their office, um, you know, you could have 20 people ordering or a thousand people ordering and, um, you know, companies are only billed for what's actually ordered. Um, that The product is actually designed for very flexible um, numbers of headcount on site. So that is definitely something that we're thinking about as we as we're talking to companies who are looking to adopt our system, who actually are going to have no idea how many people are on site for the next few months. And um, that works quite well for them because people can sign on and only use and order meals the days they're in office. Um, but obviously not use the platform when they're not. Um, so I think that's one of the first things that we're thinking about with respect to whether companies want to also subsidize meals at home. I think we are seeing some interest in doing so, and certainly it's something that our platform can facilitate. Um, most companies are probably still focusing on what their in-office solution looks like and making sure that um, they actually have a solution for when people are at work, they can access food in a safe, reliable, but also flexible way. Yes. We're seeing a lot of companies that might have used kind of sharing buffet formats or um, might have had kind of more kind of, um, I guess, fixed kind of regular meal order ordering amounts um, switch over to our cloud canteen model for that reason, because um, that flexibility is going to be something essential for them. I totally agree. It's, it's flexible or non-existent, I think, for the next period of time. So, yeah, yeah. totally agree with that. I'm going to hand over to uh, Sean, uh, who I think is going to take the conversation more towards the technology direction. Yeah, hi, Ria. Um, hi. hi, Sean. We've been working. We've been working pretty closely together over the the last uh, couple of months, and um, there's some there's some exciting stuff going on um, with the utilisation, as you say, of your your tech platform. Um, we've we've been talking quite a lot about um, click and collect, and yeah. um, with the with the the challenges of going back into the office now um, with the things like social distancing and being able to manage queues. Um, what sort of things are we going to adapt into the click and collect model to be able to help us manage that in the short term, but also give us the opportunity to grow that in the long term? Um, yeah, absolutely. We're working really closely together um, to, to integrate click and collect onto, I think, what is it, um, you know, 12 to 15 kind of large sites in June and, and probably many more beyond. And um, so obviously just the idea of click and collect is 
um, you know, if people can use an app to pre-order, purchase their meals and select a collection point in a building, um, they're not having to go and queue in a restaurant or be proximate to food um, or sort of have that traditional dining experience. They're now able to kind of order safely and collect safely um, and kind of eat their meal socially distanced from someone. So I think just the sort of mere um, implementation of click and collect is a huge step to ensuring that companies can ensure their employees get meals at lunchtime and still have access to that restaurant, but in a in a safe sort of socially distanced and compliant way. Um, and we are adding in a number of additional features as well into the platform um, to make that fit even better with the new requirements um, around COVID. So, you know, for example, we'll put capacity limits um, on certain collection points. So we make sure not too many people are going to the same place at the same time. We can help a building open up multiple collection points across the building so that people can connect, collect from different floors or different points in the restaurant. Um, and one of the things we're also looking at is um, kind of more flexibility around notifications. So um, about kind of when somebody orders their meal and how they get notified, because again, you know, this is likely going to replace them going down and queuing um, for their meal, at least in the short term. Um, and then one more piece um, that some of our some of your clients have brought up is um, you know, allowing people to reserve um, if they do want to go down to the restaurant, allowing them to reserve a slot. So again, you're managing the numbers in that restaurant. Um, and, you know, these are all things that our technology can do. And I guess what we're really excited about is it's, it's a shame that people can't go and interact with food and food service in the way that they traditionally could. Um, but what the app does is um, it not only kind of brings those menus online, but you know, with online ordering, people can get a lot more transparency about what's on menus, um, you know, the nutritional profile of that meal, um, you know, how it was sourced, like being doing something online allows you to kind of get all of that information if it's something that you want. So, you know, we think that the app ordering experience is also going to be a really delightful one for employees. And it's not exactly the same as they used to do things, but hopefully it will be it'll still be a really enjoyable experience getting getting meals at work. No, I, I, I'm I'm really excited by the uh, by the app and uh, and actually being able to bring click and collect into our business. I know it's something that we've tried previously, but this is now helping us to really um, connect with our teams without having to go through the queuing and 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 all of the uh, the challenges we're going to have through payment systems, etc. And there's a couple of other things um, that we 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 we've been talking about um, for the future adaptions to to the um, to the app. Um, we're planning. Are we planning to build loyalty into it in the future? And and also the other the other part of that is um, hospitality. You touched on on that through your other um, through ordering externally, but um, actually being able to order our hospitality internally uh, on a click and collect um, uh, app yeah. as well. Um, so on the point of loyalty, yes, already something that we're scoping in the platform and expect to go that uh, for that to go live in Q3 of this year. So that'll be the ability to collect loyalty points on any spend that goes through the restaurants. Um, and absolutely, yes, hospitality um, is something that's sort of another capability that Feeder has. So we have a platform where people can um, kind of admins, PAs, EAs across the um, the organization can kind of browse hospitality options, reserve certain um, catering for specific meeting rooms or time slots um, or departments, um, very flexibly manage kind of budgets and invoices around those orders that they're placing um, and also um, choose sort of collection points in terms of where they collect that that um, catering from in the building. So when we get to a place where it's safe enough to be, um, you know, setting out hospitality and sort of eating communally together um, um, that feature is very much there and you know in the meantime I think probably hospitality offerings will be modified into individual box formats anyway so if if it is required and um, those can be ordered and collected through our app as well. And I think the fact we can just use one app is a real advantage um, uh, to, to our business and to our clients as well. Yeah, that's always been um, the approach we've taken. Um, you know, if we if we look at kind of the feeder for delivery model um, that we work with, um, sort of five or six hundred businesses um, that we supply to five or six hundred businesses across London, um, they very often use us on both cloud canteen and and hospitality. So, 
um, cloud canteen is where they might be subsidizing specific meals for, for their employees um, to order themselves. But um, then they'll also use our, our platform for all of their kind of internal cage, catering and hospitality needs. Um, and it really streamlines things for administrators because they get a very good overview on, you know, what their team's doing, the engagement levels, the spend levels, um, you know, um, helps them really manage the process of kind of food ordering um, across different parts of the business. Um, so we've always thought about this from a central platform approach whereby, um, you know, one platform can allow um, somebody to do all the things related to food that they need to do within their company. And then all the data being in the same place as well, which is which will be really helpful for, for us. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things, for example, we're looking at is, um, as you know, with some of um, some of your clients is um, offering them the click and collect technology for their daytime orders from the on-site restaurants, but then being able to use that same app for dinner meals in the evening if people are staying out of orders and want to order from third party restaurants. Um, that flexibility also exists there. Mm. Um, and to your point of the, on the data, um, absolutely one of the things that we um, collect you sh um, so share as a business back with our customers is data about their employee engagement and spend and, 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 and what their employees are doing, what menus and meals they've liked, etc. Um, you know, we want companies to really understand how their food program is working and um, and, and to be able to, to have those statistics kind of at, the t at their fingertips. Um, and so certainly um, on that piece, um, that's something that comes with our platform. Um, and then another piece I want to touch on quickly as well is the kind of health and well-being side of things. Another real benefit to having the same app and being able to use that, that app across multiple meals in a day is that um, you're going to get access to all of our health and well-being features across your full spectrum of meals that you're purchasing at work. Um, and that's quite empowering for an individual as well. I would um, I'd really echo that point about the data. It's um, it's really exciting actually because data that we've had access to has tended to be sales data that's in the aggregate and um, we haven't been able to necessarily chart a path to say that oh if somebody ate this then they next went over there and that was their path as a consumer we've had to kind of guess that from from mm -hmm. averages so to be able to follow individual consumer paths and how their preferences develop I think is something that's really exciting and should be able to help us all serve people better. One of the things um, we're, we're really excited about is kind of responsive menu building. So if we see, um, you know, certain menu items or certain dietary preferences is really popular, um, you know, the menus and the restaurant offerings that kind of follow from there should reflect those preferences. Ultimately, that makes that that's what's going to drive up satisfaction levels and make sure that you have um, kind of menus and offerings that are really good fit for um, the workforce that's on site. Um, so that's the kind of data that our platform is capturing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, have a, I have a question here. So reminder to people that you can uh, tap your questions in and they come through to us here. So um, be good to hear what your thoughts are as well on the conversation that we're having. having. So um, Sean, not this Sean, another Sean, uh, is, I hope it's not this Sean, is asking a question about how we can engage consumers when they're coming back into their buildings to adopt click and collect as a new way of working. So what can we do to entice people to adopt this kind of new technology approach? So um, a kind of marketing and communications plan is something that's very central when we launch on any site. Um, you know, it's so important that um, a company has the right materials to share with their workforce for them to understand what's happening and, and how they can access the product and why they should access the product. Um, but also kind of, you know, you'll know from a great technology experience means that actually it's so intuitive once you download that app and you, you start going through it well, it takes you a couple of minutes to onboard and you immediately understand how and why you you should be using the product and you know we we all know of, of great examples of that you know you can open up my grandmother can open up uber and she sort of instinctively understands what she's supposed to do with it once she's got it in her hand um so not to come say i'm comparing our tech to, to ubers but um we have really thought about that onboarding flow um very very much so so um, we have a single link that employees can use to access um, the, 
the, the app and download it. And once they've downloaded it and signed up, um, it's very intuitive to, for them to, to use the product. Um, so a lot of the, the marketing and the explanation and the tutorial, the education process around how to use the app um, kind of happens within product as well. Mm. Well, yeah, you mentioned that you touched on the the health and well-being agenda, and that's one that has been is really close to our heart and has been for a while. One of the things that we've struggled with, perhaps sometimes, is how to get across the right level of information or engagement on health and well-being with a consumer who, at the end of the day, might just be in front of us and wanting to grab lunch and walk away. And, and we know from experience, if you load up a lot of messaging around that, then actually it can it can detract from the experience but now we have a partnership with someone who's got a digital platform and I know you've put a huge amount of thought into how you build a a well-being conversation mm -hmm. into your offer um, how can that help us have a better well-being conversation with our consumers so we've um yeah we've we've thought about it from sort of um we've taken two um kind of primary principles when thinking about our approach to well-being in the product we want a lot of information to be available but not enforced on people like it should be there to access and for people to use and interact with as they wish um you know we don't want to impose certain diets or content on people it should be available there for them to use um uh, to reflect the way kind of they have their perspectives sit on on how they eat um but oh and but also we've taken a, a kind of highly personalized approach to what we're doing so we want the app to feel personal to whatever someone's preferences are and um, so to give you some examples of how that plays out in terms of product features um you know if somebody wants to when they click on an item they can access all the macro nutrient information um all the ingredients and sourcing information um, they can filter meals by different um, dietary um, different dietary requirements, but also different kind of food goals that they might have. So you can filter by low carb or high protein or something like that. Uh, and then one of the newest things that we've introduced is um, the idea of setting food goals and tracking against those. So you could set that you have a certain eating goal and it could be, you know, I want to eat um, better for gut health, for example and the app will and the product will help you track um, how you're doing against that goal. So it's highly personal. Um, we also collaborate with great nutritionists and experts to provide interesting content for people to access, should that be something that's relevant for them. Um, but again, we, we don't wanna be imposing as a platform. We want that information to be there and those tracking tools to be there if it's relevant for someone to use. And as you rightly say, it's much easier to do that with a digital product than it is to necessarily give people all of that information when they're kind of in line purchasing something. Um, and so I think that's one of the benefits of kind of having a digital product that you can actually integrate that well-being approach into the way people select and, and consume their food. Yeah. I, yeah, I love that. And I love the idea that people can choose their own goals as well. And we're not, we don't need to impose one path on people because I guess that digital world opens up so much more choice for us. Sean. Do you have uh, other questions that you'd like to ask Ria? Uh, yeah, we've been we've been working. Um, you've been working quite closely with some of our teams on sites, and um, and um, how how are you um, going to support these guys as they as they ramp up and um, and their sort of skeleton um, uh, businesses come come to play and they start to ramp up. Um, in terms of sort of helping um, the, the restaurants on sites, you mean? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, helping the teams and the restaurants on site. Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of launching on a site, of course. Um, so we think about it in terms of um, making sure that we're building our tech in a way that actually reflects our processes. You know, so for example, you know, the way in which they might, um, you know, create a ticket when an order comes through and the way in which they want to notify a client that something's ready to collect. And um, that needs that can't be something that we envisage and we impose. It needs to come from the actual processes um, that happen on a site. Um, so it's, it's obviously the, the first part is making sure our product is, is fit for purpose. And the second is really rigorous and collaborative on site training. So making sure that um, the on-site restaurants and the operators there really understand how to use the technology and make it feel very simple for them so that, um, you know, it, it's something enjoyable for them to use rather than um, a burden for them to take on. 
I know all of the all of the teams that I've been talking to and all of the operators are really excited about the platform. So um, so they're very looking forward uh, very looking forward to working with you on it. So uh, um, I just I got one other question. Point, um, you know, we talk a lot about sort of tech and usability for the end customer. Um, which is obviously really important, like the employees who are ordering should have a great experience, but equally the tech and usability for the restaurant side and the operators at, at each of the stations, um, that's equally important. We sort of put equal thought into um, into what that experience is like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, got, I've got one other question. So um, the, uh, are there any other benefits that you can offer the clients um, in, in the future that will differentiate us? So apart, apart from everything else that you've offered, is there something else, you know, in the future that you're um, you're looking at? Um, I mean, I think it's it's real flexibility in solutions. Um, I think as clients come back post COVID, they're going to have so much uncertainty about, you know, how to how to administer food on site, how many people are going to be on their sites, how they can provide a food offering that is safe, but also enjoyable. Um, and, you know, we um, I think we just wrote a blog post recently, which happy to share, which is sort of talking about all the different ways feeder can support in the return to work. So, you know, even, for example, building a click and collect station within your office so that people can access the third party restaurants um, from around them so they don't have to queue locally. Um, so we are really thinking about um, very flexible and versatile solutions to sit to fit different office needs, different budgets and different requirements in this post COVID phase. And I would say that is um, I think you know any company thinking about trying to make something work for the next six to 12 months. Um, I'd, I'd encourage them to come and talk to us because we're creating all sorts of solutions, um, both on the delivery side and the click and collect side um, for companies. And in terms of our vendor community, you know, um, a number of them are going to be back up and running over the next couple of weeks. So, you know, we certainly have a lot of offerings that we can supply into workplaces. It's nice to think of those vendors coming back um, and breathing life into what we're doing again. Uh, so perhaps one last question then. Uh, Ria, how are the ways in which FIDA can help with the the return to the to the working environment, however that happens, and bringing through the positivity and some sense of the celebration that's going to come when we can actually start normalising again. I know that I'm looking forward to a decent coffee, which I cannot make on my own, and I can't <laughs> wait to get back to a workplace environment where there is so many qualified people who can help me. But what's what's Feeder's response to that, and how can you help us with the joy of coming back into the world, which I know will happen at some point for us? Well, I mean, food is like one of the most joyous parts of someone's day at work. And um, we're obviously biased when we say that. But I think giving companies a way to allow their com their employees to come back on day one and know that they have a great selection of meals that they can pick from, be excited about and eat, even though, you know, they might not be able to go over to their favorite nearby restaurant anymore or um, they might not be able to actually walk with a friend to collect that food, um, you know, we, we our cloud canteen is set up to be able to offer them a great selection of meals to choose from and something that they can order and collect and eat in a safe way. Um, and I think that's something to look forward to. And I think that's something that will add positivity to a lot of um, kind of workplace environments, especially those that are running at, at partial capacity. Um, and we can do some other really nice things. So like, you know, surprise and delight things that companies want to do for their teams in safe ways. Um, and, you know, we talk about individual packaging um, as being quite important to, to be safe. And um, one of the things our vendors do is we use kind of entirely recyclable, disposable packaging um, where possible. And so, um, you know, it should sort of um, it shouldn't concern companies too much that they're, they're probably going to have to sort of deploy more individual formats in the coming months in terms of the kind of environmental um, footprint. Um, and then, yeah, I think as kind of we come out of this, like hopefully, um, you know, team celebrations and being able to um, kind of go and collect lunch in the way that we used to, we'll, we'll start to return. But um, but um, we, we, we are prepared for the fact that it's probably a, a, at least six to 12 months before that goes completely back to the way it was. 
Ria, thank you. That's really appreciated. Uh, so we'll draw things to a conclusion. Thank you, Ria Grover, the founder and CEO of FIDA. And thank you to Sean for joining me as guest presenter. Please join us again tomorrow at 3.30 when we will be talking about the future of restaurant design. Thank you.